Before we get started, I just want to say a massive thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube members. Without your support, I don't know if I could provide free content here on YouTube, so if you are interested, I'll have a couple links down below where you can check out some of the amazing perks I offer. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump inside of Blender. So uh, like you saw at the beginning of the video, today we're going to be taking a look at how to make this scene uh, realistic in terms of lighting. This is just a still kind of photograph that we're going to be using to uh, put this bottle into. All I have is literally just the uh, camera and a couple of objects inside of here. So super basic scene. Haven't played any uh, around with any of the other settings. So we're going to start pretty much everything from scratch uh, working our way up. So first of all, let's go into the render view just to see that what we're working with. We are on the uh, EV render engine by default. So we do need to be working in cycles. Cycles just has the capability for light bouncing. And so especially for this scene, we're going to have uh, some foliage that's going to be bouncing some light on our object, as well as some of these buildings here and there are also going to be bouncing light. And so that's uh, one consideration. Uh, now, before we go ahead and uh, talk about any of the other things, let's kind of break down this scene uh, from the lighting perspective. So I'm actually going to go into my camera. I just set a background image. Let's just turn the opacity all the way up there. So yeah, let's break down the scene. This is actually a super kind of basic scene. I wanted to start out basic uh, just for all you beginners out there, but this is a uh, exterior uh, day scene. And so of course we just have our sun in the scene. This is kind of where you want to try to break out where all of your uh, lighting objects are and what is your key. Of course, our key is going to be uh, kind of the most light in our scene. And so for that, we have our sun. Uh, so just to kind of break it down here, we have this nice little light pole. We can just kind of draw a line up there and then we also have like this corner of the building we can draw a line kind of up here and now we know our sun is going to be roughly around this area uh, and now looking throughout the scene looking at some of these shadows down here i don't notice any other kind of duplicate shadows uh, to where there might be another light source in, uh, behind the camera or anything so we should be good there it should uh, just be about adding our uh, kind of sunlight in and making sure it all matches there so now that we know kind of where our light is, let's go ahead and uh, I like working kind of as a cinematographer would in the real world. And so with that, if they were actually lighting for the scene in the real uh, kind of world environment, they would be already starting with some lighting baked in, aka the sun, the sky, and some of the reflections. So what I want to do is I kind of want to set a base foundation. And the best way to do that is using a HDR image. And so what an HDR image is basically a high dynamic range image that's going to uh, produce a lot of light values for our scene realistically and then also give us a bit of reflection in our scene so those are very important for lighting our objects accurately now my favorite website to find free hdris is actually polyhaven they have a ton of amazing hdr images textures and models so i highly recommend that you guys uh, go check them out but let's go ahead and try to pick our correct hdr to uh, basically start as a foundation for our scene so the nice thing about exterior scenes is that they have a lot of sunlight HDRs out there for free. And so basically what I'm looking for in this image, if I kind of break this image down just to uh, kind of understand what exactly we need to look for in our HDRs. So first of all, we have our sunlight here we can see and uh, we want to take into account the shadows. Uh, one quick thing I do want to kind of point out real quick is that the closer a object is to the, uh, you know, uh, ground that it's actually casting the shadow on uh, the you know more sharp it's going to be so you know this point up here is being reflected down here and you can see that the uh, shadow is very very uh, sharp just because the distance between those points are very small now the opposite is true up here so that like the top of our lamp posts uh, is reflected down here and so as you can see the distance between those two are much greater and so because of that our shadow is going to be much more soft and so that's just kind of one thing that we have to keep in account so also breaking down this shot what i can notice is that we have uh, a blue sky so that's very important we want to try to get a hdr that has a blue sky also a few uh white clouds in here next let's look at some of the surrounding objects uh, so we have some kind of brown hues uh here and here and most importantly we have some green values here and so we want to try to find an hdr that has some of those green values thrown in there there's of course some stuff that we can do to add some of that green value into our environment uh, but it's always nice to just kind of get that in our uh, foundation uh, to start off with also down here we have some uh, gray values of this brick road it's a little bit gray a little bit brownish and so uh, hopefully we can find an hdr that kind of combines all those different values so let's uh, now go to polyhaven and let's just kind of browse through here what i like doing for exterior scenes is just going to skies and then i notice the time of day is roughly uh, like midday just because our sun is up here and so it's almost uh you know 12 o'clock in the sky and so uh, we can just select midday over here 
and then uh, scroll through some of these. Of course, you can look through it yourself, uh, depending on your own personal scene. Uh, but I did notice this one. The nice thing is that they actually have uh, these reflective ball images down here. So you can kind of get an idea of how the light is actually going to affect 3D objects. Uh, so the reason I like this shot so much, let's actually go to the 3D view just so we can see it, is that we do have a nice uh, kind of blue sky with some scattered clouds. There's not too many, so that's going to give us some of those blue hues onto our CGI. And very importantly is we have some of these green values here and here and also a gray road. And so all of those things uh, kind of combine to uh, make this a good foundation for our lighting in our scene. And uh, that just confirms it with some of these uh, down here. You can see uh, that the shadow is giving us exactly what we would expect from the sun. So go ahead and download whatever image that you want to pick. Let's go back inside Blender and we just need to go to the world properties. We can change color to environment texture and then let's just open up that HDR image that we have downloaded. Okay, so here is my image. Let's just open that up. And now you can see the background of our scene has changed to that image that we pick. And the nice thing is that uh, if we go ahead and unhide all of our objects, we already have some lighting and some shadows into our scene. And so that's really nice. Uh, let's actually go ahead and let's play around with some of these settings. I'm just going to kind of copy uh, some of these nodes. Uh, just because we're in the creative stage, I like to uh, make it run a little bit faster uh, just so we can have this. And I'll turn the noise off for now. Okay, so now that we have our HDR image, again, we want to try to match this as closely as possible to our scene. Uh, so let's do some things. So first of all, I don't want to see our HDR image. I only want it to affect our lighting in our scene. So let's go ahead and turn film transparency on. That's uh, something that you're going to constantly be using inside of visual effects. Now let's try to match the light direction of our scene. You can notice that we have our shadow coming down here. However, uh, by default, I automatically placed it up here. So what we can do, I'm going to bring a new window out here. Let's bring it to the shader editor. And I'm just going to hit in to hide that panel. Let's instead of object, let's go to world. And now we can see exactly what the HDR is doing. It's basically just being plugged into our background right here. So we have this little vector here and then we can actually uh, tell the rotation using that vector. So what I'm going to do, well, first of all, we need the node wrangler add on installed. So again, I just always like to kind of call attention. Uh, the node wrangler add on comes default with blender should be enabled by default. Um, but if it's not, just go ahead and check that. Uh, now with that, we can go ahead, control T, and it will add a texture coordinate mapping node. And all we want to do there is we basically just want to rotate uh, the Z until it roughly matches. Uh, now you can try to eyeball it as much as possible. What I actually like doing in a uh, you know specific circumstance like this, if we actually do have uh, some of our you know values in our scene, what I can do is let's add a mesh. I'll add a uh, cylinder. And basically what I want to try to do is I want to try to model out uh, this little thing as much as possible. Uh, so let's go ahead. I'm going to scale it down a little bit and just place it over here. And then I do need a kind of plane. So we'll just make a temporary kind of testing plane right now. And I'll set that to uh, a shadow catcher over here, just so it's only casting shadows. So now if I go ahead and I'll hit S to uh, scale it in the Z and then just scale all, all the way up. Basically, I'm just looking to match it to kind of the top uh, shape of my lamp over here or whatever object that you have in your scene. Uh, you can also do it on other objects such as like uh, this building, side of the building over here, maybe some of these plants as well. But this is just giving us a nice kind of shadow uh, to use to match the sun direction and everything. So you can see we got pretty close. However, we didn't match it perfectly. And so this is where I want to try to match it as closely as possible. You do kind of want to make sure that your uh, object is uh, kind of roughly in the same space that it would be. And so I'm mainly using this center pole right here if you can see right there i'm basically using that as kind of reference uh, for this line down here so let's go ahead and uh, match it in as closely as possible so i'm going to bring that down here and so that matches uh, roughly with the z rotation however our shadow is going a little bit longer and so this is where we can mess around with some of the x and y uh, rotation to actually affect uh, how uh, you know, high our sun is in the sky. Now you do want to be very careful. Uh, you don't want to mess around with these values too much because what you'll happen is, uh, is if you mess around with these values too much, let's go ahead and just demonstrate that. If I, uh, turn transparency back on, uh, if I mess around with some of these too much, now we have our, uh, you know, HDR I flipped and we have the ground on the sky and it'll be reflecting all the wrong colors and stuff like that. So honestly, I try to stick, uh, anywhere between 15, uh, to negative 15 on these values, just because I find that uh, if you change around too much, it'll actually introduce some, uh, you know, wonky things to your scene. So with that said, let's try to dial this in a little bit more. So I'll bring the Y a little bit like that and the X a little bit down like that. And I'm basically just trying to match these values. I think we need to mess around with the X more than the Y. So yeah, so now uh, we're getting that. And so this is where you just kind of have to play around with some of these values. 
And now you can see with these values right here, they are in that kind of uh, 30 range uh, where it's not really going to affect too much of our uh, shadows here. We can just double check that by checking the sky. And yeah, we can see that the floor is still roughly at, at the floor, uh, give or take, and our sun is at a better position. Uh, and so now let's turn that back off. You can see our shadow is roughly following this lamp. So now we know our sun is more correctly set in our scene uh, in the direction and everything. So now that I'm done with that, let's just go ahead and delete some of those objects I created. So just these two. Uh, and we'll just, uh, you know, go back to what we had at the start. Okay, so now that we have our key light established and our sun HDRIN, you can see that we're having a lot of different values, and this is uh, really nice to have. Uh, now let's go ahead and start uh, thinking about it as a cinematographer. So we need to go ahead and start breaking this up to make this more realistic. So the first thing I want to do is I want to tackle the uh, ground shadow. So uh, I have this plane here. Uh, we can make it a shadow catcher like we had the other object. Uh, the one thing I do want to call out attention to is that whatever the material is on our shadow catcher is actually going to bounce light up onto our object. So I can demonstrate that by if I come over to the object properties, I can make a new material. And then with that new material, I'll just make it kind of a red color. And now you can see uh, the material is red. We don't see it on the camera and it's still giving us our shadow. However, it is bouncing that red light onto our object. So we always want to make sure uh, whatever we have all, as our uh, ground shadow uh, catcher, we always want to have our object or our texture baked onto that. And so what I mean by that, let's go ahead and add an image texture onto it. I'll go ahead and uh, disable the shadow catcher just so we can see everything that's going on in case we do need to change anything. So let's go ahead and open up our image. So here's mine. Just going to plug the color into the base color there. And now we have this result. Uh, we can see that it is being affected by our lighting. So first of all, I'm just going to bump the roughness up and the specular down just so we can eliminate some of those reflections of the actual material. And now uh, it's giving us this result. We have to go ahead and control T. We can add a texture coordinate mapping node again and plug it into window. All window does is basically just project the texture wherever we're looking from. And since we're going to be looking from the camera when we actually render, uh, it's just going to be be projecting like that. So now uh, that is getting us a pretty good result and actually giving us some accurate bounce lighting now. I do want to kind of dial it in as much as I uh, can to make it uh, match a little bit better. So let's uh, come down here. This is where you have to play with it uh, for between material and material. All I really care about is kind of this area around here. Uh, some of these areas are over here. Uh, we can try to match as much as possible, but it is very important. Just uh, kind of this area around our object. And so let's go ahead. I like adding a gamma node at first, just because I noticed a lot of our mid-tones down here are a little bit too bright, so we'll just darken those a little bit. Uh, I'm looking at this seam uh, a little bit just to kind of gauge uh, that. I do notice it's a little too uh, red and saturated, so I'll try adding a hue saturation value now, and we can just e uh, saturate it ever so slightly. Something like that, that, that's giving us a little bit better result. I might also come over here and we'll add a RGB curves uh, node. This is, again, really kind of just dependent on your scene. Uh, we'll just play around with some of the curve. Yeah, so that's just getting some of that out. Might also go to the red channel and just get uh, a little bit of that out. And there you go. So now you can see uh, we're matching that much more accurately. I, I think uh, the darks are a little bit too dark. So I'll just ever so slightly brighten that up. I don't want to do it too much. But something like that. Uh, there we go. That matches uh, perfectly fine for what we're going to be using it for. Again, we're not going to be seeing this. We're just going to be using this as our shadow catcher. Uh, so let's go ahead. I'm going to turn outline selected back on and then we can go and come over here and turn shadow catcher back on. So now we have uh, correct bounce sliding and everything for our scene. Uh, now, if I'm also breaking down this shot in the real world, uh, there would be all these green values uh, that would be basically reflecting and also bounce uh, some bounce light bouncing off of the side here. So I do want to kind of add those uh, values in as well. So what we can do is let's go ahead and add a new mesh. I'll just stick with a plane just because it's a super simple uh, kind of 2D shot. I don't need to mess around with any uh, complex 3D geometry. Uh, but that is a consideration that if you do have a moving camera and stuff like that, maybe you would need to actually have some uh, 3D plant geometry and stuff like that. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place a plane over here. Let's, uh, you know, scale it up in the Z, uh, scale it up in the Y, uh, just kind of bring that over here. Uh, now, real uh, watch out here is we do have to turn off the shadow for this one. So let's come over to the, this, uh, the ray visibilities. We can turn off shadow over here just so it's not actually producing that shadow or anything like that. So now what we want to do is we want to duplicate that texture that we just made. And so let's, uh, I believe it's this one. Uh, yeah, so now you can see we're basically having that same effect and we're having our uh, kind of reflection of our plants over there. Uh, now I'm not liking how the darkness values are looking over here. So I'm actually going to go ahead and duplicate this. 
and then we can go ahead and just kind of reset all of these. I'm just going to hit backspace to uh, reset all of those. Uh, so now we basically just have everything default. Uh, I don't think it actually reset some of these other ones. So there we go. Uh, now we have everything back at default. Uh, let's play around with some of these values. So let's uh, set the gamma up just to match kind of that. I might also uh, do our little trick over here, outline selected back off, and automatically that's doing a pretty good job. I'll notice our plants are a little desaturated, so this is where I'm going to boost uh, the saturation here just to get some more of that green. Uh, really, I'm adding this to add a lot of the green, so that's mostly what I care about. Now, if I kind of come to the side of the thing, uh, we're not only getting our uh, reflection of our object, but we're also getting some of this green bounce line that you can see here. So this is where you can play around with that. I might uh, bump down uh, some of this. And then we'll do, just do kind of a standard uh, kind of S curve on uh, our RGB, RGB curve, sorry. Uh, so now we have this, we have uh, some of our lighting and everything is looking pretty good. Uh, one other thing, I do want to kind of get this side as well, uh, just while we're at it and why not? So let's just add another kind of mesh here and just rotate that uh, accordingly. So I'm just going to put this over here. Again, we don't have to be super accurate uh, because we're actually not going to be seeing this. We do have to, again, Let's uh, come over here, turn the outline selected back on, and I'm going to turn shadow off. Uh, now we can just, let's duplicate the that other material that we made. And this one is pretty good as well. I'm going to go ahead and reset some of the things over here. So again, I'm just backspacing these to reset those. Let's turn the gamma up and let's see what we have to do for this one. Uh, this one, I, we do need to saturate it a little bit more. Something like that. And then uh, the midtones are a little bit too right. So I'll do that on my gamma. And that's looking pretty good. Uh, honestly, that's probably where I'm going to stick. I'm not even going to mess with the RGB curves there. Uh, so now we basically have uh, some objects actually projecting our uh, texture onto our bottle and also giving us some bounce lighting. So that's very nice. Uh, let's go ahead and start worrying about compositing this and getting out a final result that has some realistic lighting and everything baked into it. Uh, so what I can do is I want to go ahead and start breaking up things. So first we have our bottle, which is nice. Let's go ahead and break up the shadow collection. So I believe that's this plane right here. Let's turn our outline selected back on. Yeah, so our shadow uh, collection goes in there. And we'll just make a new collection and name that Reflections. And we'll just place those other two plane objects inside of there. I could, you know, name all this stuff. But for, just for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to keep it like that. So now you can see this is giving, giving us a, a better, more realistic result than what we started out with. There's a few other things that we can do in compositing, uh, mainly looking at kind of the ground connection point here. Uh, we might need to work on that a little bit just to make that look a little bit more realistic. So let's go ahead and break these down. I do want to make uh, their own kind of render passes. So what I can do is I'll name this one bottle. I'll make a new uh, view layer and I'll name this one shadow. I'm just going to worry about breaking the shadow away from our bottle just so we can affect uh, some of the different values there. So uh, in our shadow collection, we don't need our reflections and we can go ahead and uh, go up to the filters, turn indirect only on. And I'm just going to make this bottle uh, indirect only. And so now you can see uh, we're just getting the shadow data in this scene and nothing else. Let's do the opposite for our bottle view layer. So I'm going to come to bottle. Uh, we can earn on the uh, reflections to be indirect only and also our shadow uh, just so we have that. You do always want to uh, have a kind of shadow thing at the bottom because if I, if I actually come over here and disable it now, you can see uh, we're not having any of that contact light and any of that image occlusion over there. So you always do kind of want to have an object on the bottom there just to get some of those values and make it look a, a little bit more realistic there. So let's go ahead and uh, go into the compositing tab. Now I am going to be uh, sticking inside of Blender for my compositing. Uh, if I was doing this for a, a real client, I'd probably render this out and take it into Nuke or After Effects or whatever there. Uh, so let's go ahead, Shift D, duplicate this down. We can have our shadow render layer there. And let's go ahead and render out an image. I'm uh, Just for the sake of now, I'm going to go ahead and set this down to 512 just so it renders super fast. Let's go ahead and render the image. Okay, so once that has finished, let's come back out here. And now we can start seeing our different layers and everything that we are going to need uh, to bring into another Blender project for the compositing. So we have our bottle and then also our shadow, which is all looking good and uh, is going to give us a pretty good result. Let's go ahead and start uh, putting these into uh, their own output sockets. I'm going to make a file output node. Uh, That's just the node to use if you want to render out multiple passes at the same time. Uh, let's go to properties. Uh, you can save whatever that you want up here. Uh, I'm just going to be keeping it super simple for this tutorial, leaving it on uh, PNG with alpha. And then I'll, uh, since it's just a still image, I'll compress that 100%. It's not going to lose any data because PNG is actually a lossless format. Let's go ahead and add a, uh, another input. I'm going to name the first one bottle. 
And then the second one, I'll just name Shadow like that. Uh, so let's plug them in for now. So we have those two and uh, those are all good. Now, if you remember, let's uh, kind of break this down up here. I do want some information here for the ambient occlusion. Now there are kind of many ways to do ambient occlusion uh, for still, you can actually go in and kind of mask out the different areas and stuff like that. But Blender automatically comes with a ambient occlusion pass. So let's try to uh, utilize that and see if that helps us at all. So I'm going to come over here to the uh, view layer properties. We do have to enable them for both view layers since I want uh, the control uh, from the ambient occlusion for both. Uh, so let's go ahead, come down here, ambient occlusion, and then we'll turn the ambient occlusion on for our shadow as well. And then if we come back up to the compositing tab, we now have these uh, new sockets here. They're not uh, showing anything. That's because we haven't rendered, the de uh, rendered out an image uh, yet. So let's go ahead and render that. Okay, so once that has finished rendering, we can come back in here. And now we actually have our ambient occlusion passes uh, for both. You can see that we have this here. It's actually giving us some ambient occlusion up here as well. And so that's also nice information. If we do want to mask out that section and add some more ambient occlusion up there. And then we also have our shadow ambient occlusion, which is going to give us a pretty nice mask to be able to affect uh, just the part around uh, the contact point between our ground and our object. So that's very important. Let's uh, create a new kind of uh, file pass for both. So I'm just going to name uh, OBJ AO, and then we'll just name this uh, Shadow AO, like so. And there we go. So now we can plug those uh, back into these. So now we can go ahead and uh, talk about rendering this out and uh, compositing everything back together. So um, this is where I can uh, maybe bump this up a little bit. I'll just go ahead and do a quick kind of denoise, just because it's a still image. Uh, it's going to be easy to. Uh, just do a quick uh, no denoise image there. And then once we're happy with this, one final thing that we always kind of want to check before you render out everything is that the scale of our scene is set up correctly. And that's very important for many reasons, especially if you're doing a camera track shot uh, because of motion blur, depth of field, uh, animated occlusion, all that kind of stuff is kind of affected by all of that. So we want to make sure our scene scale is set up correctly. In order to do that, there are kind of many ways to kind of check that. You can use the ru ruler uh, icon up here. What I like doing is I'll just create a new kind of little test mesh. We'll just name it cube. I'll just go to the side view in edit mode. And we'll just uh, G Z has uh, snap that up just so our origin point is on the floor here, just because when we scale, I always want the uh, object to actually be sitting on our floor. If you're familiar with camera tracking, that's a very common kind of practice there. Let's go to N uh, over here and the dimensions. We want to set these to be basically the site uh, size of whatever you want. I'm going to stick with uh, a basically six foot person. So six feet is basically 1.8 meters so i'm going to place that here the x and y doesn't really matter as much so we'll just do 0.5 right there so now we know this is basically the rough size of a human in the uh, real world uh, as i like to use it and so as you can see it's way smaller than what our actual shot is set up as there are many different ways uh, to scale everything uh, correctly and have them you know kind of match in between each other what i'm going to do is i'm just going to go ahead and uh, take a empty Plane axis is totally fine. I'll just kind of bring that out here. And what I want to do is I want to select all of my objects that I want to actually scale uh, independently, or sorry, attach to our empty. So that includes the camera, our object, and then also our ground plane. Let's not forget the reflections also. So let's make sure we are selecting the reflections. So these uh, up, up here as well. So finally, let's select the empty. We just want to make sure that that is our last one we select in yellow. We can go ahead and uh, hit Control-P to parent and then just parent everything to the empty. Now, wherever we move our empty, it's gonna move everything besides our human. Uh, because again, our human is like the one that we don't wanna affect, uh, we want it to remain the same uh, as we scale. So let's go ahead and scale this up just so our human is you know, roughly the size of how uh, you know tall a actual human would be. And so I would think right around there is maybe a good six foot uh, size. I can go ahead and we'll hide the reflections again. Uh, so I'm just kind of looking at these windows and maybe we do need to uh, scale it down just a little bit. So something like that, maybe uh, it's really hard to tell for these scenes uh, sometimes just because, uh, you know, I don't know how tall these windows are. And so roughly uh, I would think like a six foot uh, person would be that tall. It's within margin of error. Right. And so uh, I, I'm totally comfortable leaving it like that. So let's go ahead and delete our cube object. And now that we have uh, pretty much everything set up again, since we did parent everything, everything is in the exact same location. So it's not going to mess up our render there. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll turn this back to uh, be off for our shadow again. And let's do one final check that everything is plugged in. I'll go ahead and save it in a new file location. 
once you have it saved uh, wherever you want it to save, let's go ahead and render the image. And uh, since it's a file output node, it'll actually render uh, if you just render a singular image. Okay, so once those have finished rendering, we'll have these four images, and now we are actually ready to hop in compositing. Now again, I'm just going to be keeping it easy for this and sticking inside of Blender. So we do need to open up a new uh, file general to go in the compositing workspace. The reason we need to do this is uh, we need to go ahead and set the color management instead of AGX. AGX is the best for kind of CGI and rendering there. Uh, we need to set this to standard. And so standard is going to be the best thing for any 2D kind of plates we're working with. So movie clips, image sequences, all of that stuff. So let's go ahead, I wanna add a image node. We can go ahead and open up our footage, first of all. Okay, so just a still image here. And then I'm gonna just gonna uh, shift D, duplicate that down. We'll uh, go and find the other render passes that we just rendered out as well. Okay, so there we go. We have everything in our scene. Uh, we do have to make sure that we do set the uh, correct aspect ratio and resolution up here. So let me go ahead and uh, plug those numbers in. Okay, so now that I have my correct resolution here, we can actually start compositing. So I'm gonna keep it super simple. We'll just uh, do a quick alpha over to combine. Uh, we'll do first our image on top and then our CGI uh, kind of main pass down here. Just plug that into here. Uh, so now if we view that shift control click there, we now have this combined and everything is looking uh, nice and matched there. And then you will see we do have the kind of this uh, white ring of pixels around there. And so we do have to uh, go ahead and pre-multiply our footage. The way to do that in Blender is to just add a alpha convert node. And now you can see it's uh, al uh, basically applied our alpha to our actual CG layer. So now we have this, this is looking good. Let's go ahead and add our shadow in. So I'm just gonna use our shadow pass down here and I'll just use the alpha on an RGB curves uh, node right here. So alpha into the factor there. And now we can play a little bit around with this. So let's go ahead and try to match our shadow. I am kind of using this over here as reference. So over here, we'll notice that we have a little bit of blue cues and stuff like that. So we wanna try to match it as closely as possible. Uh, so let's bring uh, the kind of gamma tones down like that. And then we do have a lot more bright areas down here. So let's go ahead and bring those down as well. Something like that. And then uh, some of our dark values down here, I'll bring those as well. Uh, I am noticed we're getting a lot of kind of darker, darker values and I don't want to crush those all the way. I'm going to bring this just up just a tiny bit, just so we're not bringing uh, those and crushing those down as much. So that's a perfectly fine thing. I might also uh, go to the blue channel and we'll brighten the gamma in the blue just a little bit, just to match uh, some of the kind of blue hue that we're seeing over there. So that looks pretty good, uh, good enough for what we need it for now. Uh, we will notice it's looking a little bit fake and that's to do with the ambient occlusion. I always find that Blender doesn't do a great job with ambient occlusion. So that's why I kind of like having some mask out here to uh, adjust that as well. So let's go ahead and adjust some of that. So first we'll just do the ground kind of ambient occlusion. So I'm gonna bring our uh, shadow AO pass over here. We'll just duplicate this uh, RGB curves and let's go ahead and just backspace to uh, disable that. So now we can see we have this image and this alpha, the alpha for some reason on ambient occlusion for Blender does not actually have the correct alpha. So what I'm gonna do, uh, go ahead and do is just use the image uh, because the image is a black and white uh, mask in of itself. So that is gonna be totally fine. Let's plug it into our factor over here. Uh, so this is just affecting our kind of shadow and this is our ambient occlusion. So let's uh, view what that is doing. So if I go ahead and we'll just, you know, kind of bring the midtones down, you can see it's affecting everything. And that's because by default, uh, the white is set to be uh, what we're actually affecting. So first of all, we need to invert the mask. So let's invert that. And now uh, the white is actually uh, where our amount occlusion is. So that's good. We are noticing that we have a lot of gray values and also some white add down here. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna add a color ramp node and we'll just plug that kind of before our invert color. I wanna kind of crunch some of these values down here just so we're getting rid of some of these gray values. Now you can see we're really affecting this mask. You just uh, kind of make this area over here. Um, now, very weird, again, I, I don't love the uh, ambient occlusion uh, node inside of Blender, but we are having all this white over here. So this is where we need to go ahead and add a custom mask. And since this is a still image, it's uh, super nice and uh, kind of easy there. Let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna bring a new, we'll go to VFX masking. And let's open up our ambient occlusion pass. Okay, so just this one right here, let's open that image. And all I wanna do is just kind of solo out the area around here. So let's go ahead, add a new mask. And then if I hold control, I can kind of just, uh, you know, click and drag and make this a, a quick little mask out here, uh, just so it eliminates everything outside of that mask. Now back inside of the compositing workspace, we're just gonna add a mask node. We can select that mask we created. And I'm just going to combine it. So let's go ahead and add a math node for this. 
I'll plug our color into the top socket and then this one into the bottom socket. And then if we set this one to multiply, basically multiply is just going to multiply those values together. And uh, because this one, all of the white values are multiplied by all of the uh, black values over here. It's basically just going to solo out our little mass down here. So let's replace the multiply in our factor. And now, uh, finally, we can affect uh, the kind of ambient occlusion down here. So let's uh, zoom in again, Alt V to that. I wish you could zoom into a particular area. It's kind of annoying there, but uh, whatever. Uh, so let's bring our highlights a little bit uh, down as well. And our midtones and, uh, you know, darks like that. Uh, so that's looking good. We're having that problem again. So I do want to kind of bring up the kind of edge like that. Now you can see we're just adding a little bit of ambient occlusion over there just to blend this in a little bit better. You can hopefully see that's doing a little bit to uh, make that a little bit more realistic looking. The nice thing is that we pretty much have everything set up now. So now we can affect this color ramp and, you know, really dial that kind of ambient occlusion look in. And we can use uh, the reference of uh, some of these other objects in the scene uh, over here. So like uh, these plants and stuff, we can see the amity occlusion and stuff on that. Honestly, uh, that is looking a pretty good result for me. So that is what I'm going to stick with. That's basically the same process uh, for our amity occlusion on our actual uh, bottle. What I am going to do is I'm going to put everything before our pre molt just so our pre molt is going to apply uh, the alpha and everything and, you know, just get us a, a nice little solid thing there. So let's go ahead. I'm going to use this again. We can uh, duplicate our RGB curves down. I want to replace the uh, image to the factor. And again, we are having that similar issue where everything uh, white is black and black is white. So we do need to invert everything just because we actually want the uh, ambient occlusion parts to be white. So now it's giving us this result. And the nice thing, since we're actually pre-multiplying everything afterwards, is that we can change all of these values. And uh, it should, in theory, uh, be fine in our uh, pre-multiplication uh, pre process. Uh, so we don't have to add like all this crazy mask section up here. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm just going to duplicate down this color ramp so we can uh, kind of crunch some of these values in down here. Uh, let's bring that down. And we'll. I just want kind of the bottom section here. So we'll just kind of play around with that. That looks pretty good. Uh, so now is where we can come back into the alpha over section. And this is where we can really dial in uh, the look and kind of, you know, feel of our animated occlusion. So notice we have some nice fall off there. Uh, we can even make it a little bit darker towards the bottom. And then I might bring the highlights just a little bit up. Uh, so now you can see we're having this result. I do. I don't like there's like kind of a harsh line right here. I might be hard to see on YouTube, but all uh, all we can do to get rid of that is just kind of move these values away from each other. So I'm actually going to move the black value down a little bit. So now it's a little bit more feathered, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, so that is pretty much it. You can see it's adding a little bit of ambient occlusion just on the bottom as well, kind of blending in that edge. And uh, that is, you know, looking good there. The final thing I want to do is just kind of do a, a quick little kind of color pass uh, for the color of my main model right here, just to kind of, um, you know, blend it into the uh, whites of the scene a little bit more. So we'll just add another RGB curves node. It's kind of my favorite uh, node to use now for, uh, you know, everything coloring. So I notice everything here is a little bit too dark. So I'm just going to brighten the gammas, first of all. So I don't want to go too much, something like that. And then the uh, we'll break down the highlights are a little too dark as well. So I'm going to boost the highlights up. So something like that. And then we'll just go ahead ever so slightly decrease some of the darker values. So something like that. It's a little bit too much. It's actually doing a lot more than I thought. So as you can see, just with playing around with the curves a little bit there, we were able to just brighten it up and match it into the white of the scene as it would actually be. Um, and so, yeah, so that's basically it. You can see uh, we were able to get a pretty good result. Um, if I go ahead, let's just uh, have some fun and deselect all of the nodes uh, just to see kind of the before and after. So you can see this is kind of the before we had all of our uh, kind of shadow and lighting and all that stuff. And just with some basic compositing, we are able to get a more realistic result. Uh, so let's go ahead and render this out one final time. I'm going to plug this over here into the composite node. And now since we're using the composite node, this is where we can come over to the output properties and actually select, uh, select some of these. So uh, actually, since it's a still image, I won't bother with uh, exporting over here. We'll just change this up to 100. Again, I'm just going to save it as a PNG. That's totally fine. And what we can do is we can actually just go ahead and render a image up here and then just save it as afterwards. So uh, that is the result that we're getting. Let's just hit uh, image, save as, and we can save it wherever we want up here. Okay, so here is the final result that we got out of Blender. Again, uh, we are able to get a pretty realistic result. I didn't go over all of the kind of compositing steps, uh, which would be, you know, adding grain to the shot, making sure 
uh, we blur the object to match the blur levels of the camera and everything. This was more just like focusing on the lighting. But I feel like we got a pretty co uh, good result and it matches the environment and sits uh, very well in the environment. You can see that we're having some of the reflections of the buildings here, which is really nice. I do see a uh, little seam right here. So if I was doing this legit, I might try to go in there and extend up that little reflection plane that we did over there. Uh, but th that's totally fine. I don't notice it unless I'm really kind of breaking this shot down. Uh, but hopefully you were able to get a similar result or learn a thing or two on the way to apply to your own visual effects again this was just a super kind of basic lighting scene setup uh, if you are doing a little bit more uh, kind of interesting lighting setups I know interior lighting is much harder to do than exterior lighting and also this uh, scene was pretty easy because we just had a flat kind of ground plane if you did have a uh, lighting bouncing on you know complex objects if we had a CG object over here then it would be casting shadow and all of this complex uh, you know plant geometry and stuff like that so that's just kind of how I go about uh, working and breaking down a shot like this and uh, you know getting it ready to uh, get a realistic result as you can see here so uh, again thank you guys so so much for watching i have a patreon uh, link is down below if you want to consider following me there i'd really appreciate it but anyways thanks so much for watching and i will see you in the next video